Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Living on Purpose Ministries. You are tuned in to WGSNDB Going Solo Network, where I am your host, Davida Smith, and along with our producer, CC Schatz. Listen, I know you can already hear it. I'm a little under the weather today, but nonetheless, God is good. I absolutely could not miss another week of not being on here with you guys. You guys give me my energy, so I appreciate each and every one of you who tuned in today. And if you watch the replay even, greetings, 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 bless you. We appreciate you being right back on here with us. And I left off the last time. Um, I am actually in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. I had to take a course Hey, Timika. Um, I had to take a course here in Kansas City and um, it has been a fabulous, I believe, in developing, I believe in growing. So this is where I've been. So y'all forgive me for the last two weeks. This class was three weeks long. So for the last two weeks, my timing was off. Um, so I do apologize to every viewer um, because of the time difference. So um over there, I can manage that pretty well because I'm kind of used to the Eastern Standard Time and the European time. But here it was just a little bit different. But we left off last time talking about the um, the word is nigh. And I wanted to kind of got, dive into that so you could kind of get an understanding. What, God, what was God talking about? Or what does that mean when the word is nigh? Um, and nigh means near. Okay, nigh, N I G H means near. Um, and I'm going to start us off by looking at the scripture in Isaiah 51, Isaiah 51, verse 16. And it's in the New Living Translation that I'm reading from, or I'm going to be coming from. And I want you to hear this powerful statement that the Word of God has said to us. Okay, and when you hear me talk like this, I want you to understand, even though Isaiah was writing this for their day and their time, The word of God is for us today. So when we take the word of God, you have to internalize it as to how does that word apply or how can I apply what God's word says to me? And I want you to hear these powerful words that God says to you tonight. It says, I have put my words in your mouth. How exciting is that? I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely. In my hand, I stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. I am the one who says to Israel, you are my people. So look at that. Not only did God say, I have put my words in your mouth, but he has given us a sense of safety even in the scripture by telling us, but I even hid you safely in my hands. Oh, my God. When I read that, I was so super excited because you just got to know that, you know, that, you know, that you are safe. They say there's no other safe, safest place to be in the world, in the whole wide world, except for in the will of God. What does that mean? When God gave me his words, he gave me something more powerful than anything else in this world. Most people sleep on this only because When we think about that, you don't even understand that there is no other creature, no other being that God made. Hear me on this. There is no other creature, no other being that God made that he gave audible words, voice to like he is, except humans. Do you understand that? So when he made man, when he made Adam, he was the only thing that he had created in his image. Is that not the word? It says in um, Genesis one, I'm going to create man after my likeness. Everything that I am, I'm going to create man just like that. So he says in Isaiah 51 and 16, I have put my words. Okay, so. I want us to go back a little bit and think about Genesis just for a second, because we had to trace this so you can kind of see where I'm going with this, because we're going to talk about how powerful the word is being not even in your mouth. The the, the scripture um, declares that your deliverance even is not even in thine own mouth. So half of the things that you really need is right there under 
your nostrils and right above your chin. OK, that's why he says even when we have situations, that's why he told us in uh, Mark in chapter 11, he said, when you have an issue and that thing looks insurmountable, he said, you can do what to the mountain? Speak to it. Your words are powerful and they can play on something good or they can really play on something bad. So let's look at that. When God created man, the Bible says he he formed him out of the dust of the earth, right? That's what he said. Because even in Isaiah 51, I want you to see how these things correlate. He said, even in um, Isaiah 51 and 16, he said, I stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. He did that. When he spoke, in Genesis chapter one, the Bible declares, he said, there was nothing here. There's no light. So let me speak to it. And he said, God said, let there be light. And then there was what? Then there was light. And then he says, OK, I want to separate the light from the darkness. And it did that. He said, OK, well, I want to put some beasts in the field and some fowls in the air. And all these things came to be. And he did all of that. And he looked around. And on the first day, he said, this is really good. This is great. But he says, look, I got all this stuff, but I don't have anyone to tend to it. I don't have anyone that can enjoy the fruits of the things that I've put here. And so the Bible said he decided, let me make man. And the Bible says he made man, but man just kind of laid there. It wasn't like everything else, because the second he said something, I want to catch. I want you to catch this in the spirit, if you would. Man was made just like he did everything else. He made him out of the dust of the earth. He did everything. The difference. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Could you hear me? I don't know if you could hear me before because I just realized that I that when that happened, my volume was uh, switched off. So crazy. Here she is. <laughs> so the Bible declares. Okay. Okay, y'all. I don't know what happened. And then when my phone chimed in and somebody tried to call in, it just threw everything off. So I'm sorry. Yeah, that's but, what I thought. Okay, here we go. <laughs> So the Bible declares that man became a living soul, but it wasn't until after God breathed into his nostrils. So when he breathed into his nostrils, life came into Adam. But only thing that was in Adam was the breath of God, which means everything that God was, he breathed into Adam. So he tested Adam at the end. Remember, we talked about this. He tested Adam at the very end and said, what? Name these animals. And he named every single animal that God had put out there. Not with having been told, not with have ever seen them, because mind you, he was just formed. 
So he named everything and God said, that's good. So he tested him to make sure that what he had put in his mouth, come on, somebody was going to be what and who God represented, who and what he was. So Adam did that. But then he messed up and then we were put out. Okay, but through the redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ, we were what? Brought back in. So that same principle still stands. You are my people. So what I'm saying to you is God says, I have put my words in your mouth and I have hid you safely in my hand. That's what the Bible declares to us. In Matthew, I think, chapter nine, he said, you can ask what you will when you pray. You can ask whatever you will and it shall be done unto you. Why is that? Because when you give God back his word, then the word does exactly what it says. He says, I keep watch over my word. I'm not worried about nothing else. I'm not worried about he say she said. We have to put the word of God in our mouths. So whatever God has told you, that is what it shall be. And so I want to look at this a little bit because I want us to focus on how powerful you need to know that your mouth is. So let's take a look at the book of James really quick. The book of James chapter three. Okay. What happens when you open your mouth? Okay. So in James chapter three, and I'm going to slowly go down this. And if we have to continue on next week, that will be fine. And again, I don't want y'all to hear me having to sound like a frog the whole afternoon. So look at what it says here in James chapter three. What happens when I open my mouth in chapter? I mean, verse one, it says, don't. And I'm reading from the message Bible. It says, don't be in any rush. Listen to this to become a teacher, my friends. Now, wow. Why do you think he would say that? Why do I not need to be in a rush to be a teacher? Now, most of you know my testimony. I used to be a preschool teacher. Never in a million years would have saw myself there. But it says don't rush to be teachers. Now, I want you to see why he says that. Teaching is highly responsible work. What I'm doing right now, he says, is a highly responsible work. Why? Because you have people that are sitting there getting attached to every word that comes out of your mouth. Now, this was powerful for me because it made me even relook what I do here on the broadcast very much so that it made me be accountable to the things that I'm saying. Are you listening to me? It says teachers are held to the strictest standards. And none of us is perfectly qualified. Man, was I glad to hear that. Listen, I thank God for the schooling because I did go to school for this. So don't know nobody mistake that. But at the same time, he says, even in the word of God, he says, and none of us is perfectly qualified, even though we've been trained, even though we've gone to school for this stuff. Nobody is perfectly qualified qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. I'm reading you what it says in the message Bible. It says, if you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in a perfect control of life, which means it doesn't matter what we try to do. You're not always going to say the right things. You're not always going to do the right things with your speech. Listen, we make mistakes every single day. I completely understand this scripture now, and I completely understand why growing up, I was always misunderstood. I don't know who's on this line or who's going to get on this line and watch this or view this later. But if that is you, take yourself completely off the hook. You can say something and no matter how you say it, it's always misconstrued or misunderstood. Listen, he's letting you know. Even though you say it, we don't always get it right or we don't always put it in the right terms or we don't always put it in the right context or we don't put it in the right tone. He says, if you find that person, look at what he said, if you find that person then whose speech is perfectly true, you found a perfect person and a perfect control of life. Well, we already all know we are not perfect. 
Okay, if you think you're perfect, then you you go head on. But for those of us that can admit I am not perfect, <laughs> let me be the first to say I am not perfect. Okay, but verse three through five says it this way. This is so awesome. It says a bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. Woo! Now we all know how big a horse is. And the bit is just this little leather thing that goes up in his mouth. But it is amazing how small that little thing is. But the but the Bible declares, but that one little thing controls the whole what? Mouth of the horse. And this is a small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest of winds. So even if you've been on a ship, that little itty bitty um rudder, or like we like to call it like a little sterner wheel, but it's called a rudder, all right, that controls that big old ship from from crashing in the water. Glory to God. And then he says, but check this out. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. Now, this is where we're going with this today, because if it's not building and if it's not accomplishing what God sent for the word to do, because according to Isaiah 55, he says when he sends out a word, this is something powerful because I need you to understand when we say words and then we say God's words back to him. The Bible declares when that word goes forth, the Bible declares it shall accomplish what it was sent to do. So if you tell your words to do something, guess exactly what your words are going to do. It's going to go and do exactly what you say. You, if you talk negative to yourself, and you say, I'm never going to be able to do that. You know what you just did? You just put an, a, 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 a set out word on yourself to assassin your own self. Nobody had to do it. You did it to yourself. When you say I'm ugly or I'm fat, you know what you did? You just assassinated yourself with your own mouth. Nobody has to do it. You know why you continue to feel that way? Because you said it. You put that declaration out there on yourself. I'll never be able to amount to any half of the stuff that I see other people do. Why would you say that about yourself? Why would you limit what God's words say that you can have for yourself? So you can think you could do something that would be accomplishing. Um, he said you can accomplish nearly anything. Or you can destroy it. With your mouth. Now look at this. It only takes. Now I'm reading verse 5. It only takes a spark. Remember to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word. Out of your mouth. Listen to this. Can do that. By our speech. We can ruin the world. Turn harmony into chaos. Throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. Now, this messed me up. Listen, he said it only takes a spark. We know you can be lighting a match. And if the spark jump off on the leaves, it's going to catch the leaves on fire. We know from looking at places like California or some of these other places that had these wildfires. Baby, it only takes one. But that one spark or that one set of fire can set a blaze a whole forest. And it takes hours upon hours and mountains of water upon mountains of water to what? Put that fire. It was just a simple fire, but it takes so much energy and so much effort to get that fire put out. Gossip. Bad negative talk is worse than anything else in the world. Why? Because it says even that you could throw mud on a person's reputation by not even knowing the whole story. But because you would open your mouth to keep dousing the fire. Come on, somebody. You done messed up and made somebody, you know, be something that they are not. 
I have learned as an adult that it is amazing to me that some of us that are in our 40s and 50s and things of that sort, it is amazing to me, especially women. I love y'all, so don't hate me tonight, okay? But especially women, you cannot like somebody because another person said something about them and you haven't even taken the time to get to know that woman for yourself. But because somebody has put their mouth come on somebody, on them in a negative manner or a negative light, you jumped right in with the conversation or you jumped right on the bandwagon and decided you did not like them either. What was the justification? What was the value? What was the accomplishment of that? What did that do for that individual? I'm at a, I'm as I get older, I'm at that stage in my life. If I can't add value to people's lives, I don't even want no parts of it. So we got to get to that place where what are, if what you're doing is adding value, then that is wonderful. But if it's not adding value to somebody, you know what you're doing? You're being negative. That's just it. Point blank. If you're not saying something positive, if you're not doing something positive, even if it's constructive criticism, come on, y'all not going to hear me tonight. Even if it's constructive criticism, your words will be seasoned with L-O-V-E, even with love. I can take a criticism even as long as I know you love me when you said it. Come on, somebody. We're talking about our words. So when we give words If that word is not edifying, that's what the Bible calls it. You should be edifying somebody with your words, building them up, not tearing them down. Come on. We're not supposed to be taking them and ripping them apart with our words. We say our words are not. Why? Because the second I send that word out, It has a mission. Come on. I want you to type that out to yourself or write it out on a piece of paper. When I sent a word, I just sent my word on a mission. When you say words, you're not just giving words. And the reason I'm really going to hit you in the head with this one, the Bible declares that when we die, come on, somebody, when we die, the Bible says, I will give the Vita. Come on, I'm talking about myself right now. But when I die, I will have to give an account for every word. Come on, somebody. I want you to understand how important this is. I'm not saying this just because it sounds cute. This was something that was laid on my heart because I really think we have to be reeled in sometimes about the things that we say and that we do. He said, you will give an account for every word and for every deed that you have done, come on, point to yourself, in this body. So everything that I say, his Holy Ghost pen is writing it down. And I had to be mindful of that. It has, it's, it's, a, it's a concerted effort every day. He said, because I know your thoughts even before you speak them. Come on, that's why he said a man, as a man, what? Come on. Point to your, t- to your dome. As a man thinketh, so is he. Even before it gets or formulates to your mouth, you thought it. And if you think it long enough, it's going to become a part of your speech. Because the Bible also declares that for out of the abundance of your heart, your heart is your mind and your heart heart. Out of the abundance of that, the mouth what? speak it. Those things begin to express themselves. That's why I tell people, you can tell exactly where a person is a lot of times if you just hush and listen. If you listen to them talk, you can tell exactly where they are. I can tell people who angry. I can tell people who bitter, who got um, resentment and all these different things. You know why? Because it comes all out in their speech. They may not think it, or you can even tell them, you sound like you're angry about that. You No, I'm not angry. Um, but your speech is saying something totally different. You know, our speech says everything. And so we can come across or we can say certain things. But guess what? Your mouth don't lie. Your mouth don't lie because it says exactly what was in your heart. Whatever you say, and it, you can hear people say sometimes I've heard people that have said racist things or prejudiced things. 
And then they'll come back behind it and go, you know, I was just playing. No, you wasn't. When you said it, that's exactly what you meant. Because you, if you didn't mean that, you wouldn't have said it. Nobody tell people, be careful what you say. Because you really tell people what's in your heart. He said, whatever's in there, if you ain't careful, it's coming out. It's going to spill right out. So I tell people, you can hear it. You can hear it in yourselves. You can hear it in politicians. You can hear it in the people in your family. You hear it come out. I give you another perfect good example of that. Have you ever done something for somebody? Or somebody, no, better yet, has somebody ever done something for you? And then they kept talking about what they did. And they kept reminding you what they did, kept speaking about it. You know why? Because in their heart of hearts, they really didn't want to do it. When you have a heart to really give help, the ministry of helps, really want to do something for someone, you don't have to talk about it. That's why the Bible even told us in, um, I think it's Matthew chapter 5. I want to say it's chapter five or no, chapter six. And he's talking to the disciples when he is te- trying to teach them how to pray. He said, don't go out and pray open in the public to be seen. You know, he was letting them know, I don't need you to make this a public thing where you trying to get seen by other people. He said, because if that's what you're going to do, then you already have your reward. You were seen by the people. Do you know how many people work at walking that? Just loud, just got to be talking, just to be seen, just to be heard. Everybody got to know all about you and how many cars you got, how many houses you got. Just boastful. No. When God blesses us, he said, look, when I bless you, He said, you ain't got to tell people that. That's why he was teaching them that when you pray in secret, it says God will reward you openly, meaning nobody has to know what I'm praying. You know why? Because God is going to manifest everything that I said. Y'all not going to talk back to me tonight. I know I'm talking better than y'all said. Amen. Listen. When you pray to God in secret, that's the book. When you pray to God in secret, I'm going to keep saying that. Maybe somebody going to catch on. When you pray to God in secret, God says, I will reward you openly. That's why I don't get offended. When people don't even know I'm broadcasting, I don't get offended when there's things that God has blessed me and platforms that he's opened for me that I don't make a big deal about it. You know why? Because when God is ready for this to be a reward that's going to be open, it's going to be God's doing, not Davida, not CC. When God is ready to take us to the next level, you won't have to talk about it. God is just going to manifest that thing and slap you out there and then be like, this was what you was rehearsing for. This was what you were getting all this preparation for. This is what I was teaching you behind the scenes. This is what I was getting you ready. This is what we have to get to. Being comfortable with God just taking us. He said, despise not the day of small beginnings. What can start out really, really, really small? Because believe me, I will admit, I did not think my mouth would still be open at this present day on September, the what's the date? The 26th, 2019, never had a, a thought or even a recognition that one, someone would reach out to me and be interested in what was in my mouth, but better yet, then ask me, can you take what's in your heart and what's in your in your belly that God has placed there and then openly share it with the people? Never in a million years thought three years ago, I would still be going. This is how long it's been. She and I met in 2016. So it's it doesn't seem like it's been three years because it went by so 
fast to see where we've come. Even in the production, I was you couldn't even see me originally. I was just a voiceover on a podcast. And now you're able to get a actual physical, visible, visible broadcast to see where we're able to connect anywhere in the world and still be able to do this, have people on as guests. She's had um, show after show to launch. Why? When we begin to speak God's word, and when you're diligent over the things that God has given you, he said, those things that you do for me in private or those things you do that you weren't looking for the handout or the hand up or the hook up, you don't have to do that. Why? Because your words are powerful. You just tell God what it is that you desire to do for him. And God even told us in some, I will take the very desires of your heart and manifest them. And those things would come to pass. I am a living witness of this word. But I want us to understand if we are careless or we wrongly place our words out of our mouth. I'm so sorry. Out of our mouth, we can ruin things. The Bible declares we can ruin the world. We're seeing that every day. Where people with very destructive mouths, with great influence, come on, leadership is influence. This is a quote from John C. Maxwell. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So people who have great platforms use their mouths to destroy people. It's terrible, but it's the truth. And it doesn't matter how we slice it. We have a responsibility. Did I not read that? He said teachers are highly responsible work. Did I not read that in the beginning? Teachers are held to the strictest standard. What does that mean? Because you are influential, because people are clinging to the words. Come on. The words that are coming out of our mouths. I'm going to hold you accountable for that because those words mean something to God. We're influencing whether it's good or bad. You're going to give an account to it, but you're going to have a stricter account to it. Why? Because we either can influence people with our words to do something fabulous in their life, or we can influence people to be some very dark, negative people. And so as teachers, we have a great responsibility. And then he goes on further in verse seven and says this. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. What? You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God, our Father, And with the same tongues, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. It should not be so. Listen, how can we say with our mouths that we love each other? And then no second than that sister or that brother turns from you. You're talking about them. We do it. I told you it's a concerted effort every day to be truthful, to be candid, to be frank and very honest with where you are. Gossip, I tell you, is the number one thing. And I'm not speaking this just for my women because I've listen, I met a guy here in my class who just is messy as a woman. So men can be gossipers and messy too. They really can. But it's about your words. If it's not sowing some kind of value or something positive, I promise you it's only sowing discord or mischief. That is not on the side of the fence that we want to be on. He said, we can do it, but the tongue cannot be tamed. 
So that's why you must give an account for it because everything you allow it to run and do, you're going to have to tell God about it. Why did I say that? Why didn't I police that up? Why didn't I go back and apologize? I knew I was wrong for that. You know, these are the things that make us really think and be accountable. And I said, Lord, you know, I need you to bridle my tongue. Just like you put that bit in that horse's mouth, bridle my tongue. Make sure I'm not saying things that's mean and hurtful and and just dishonest. And, and, you know, because he says a liar, we won't even tarry in his sight. A half truth is still a lie. Tell the people the truth. I want to be upfront and as honest as I can. Listen, I'm getting ready to wrap this up because my nose is starting to go crazy here and I don't want to be snorting on, 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 on the live feed with you guys. But listen to this. There was a gentleman here in the class and I was really upset because a part of our graduation process, we had to do what they call a capstone. So anybody know about master's programs or any other programs, you know, before you can leave the school or before you can graduate or before you can give a class, you have to do all this work as a team, you know, usually it's a team effort or you have to do a lot of research work, whatever, and make this capstone as a presentation before you can leave the school. Well, our capstone was today, but prior to today and a lot, well, I was just completely thrown off as far as my work and my time zones and stuff. It's because we had to get together a lot every evening, even after we got out of school to do a lot of research, a lot of stuff and a lot of studying together and getting everything together for the presentation before today, because we had a short amount of time. And we had to pick a capstone that was a real life situation. So this gentleman told us, you know, hey, this and that's going on in my organization. And we wanted to represent something that was live. And that was a problem. And then we had to figure out what will we put, what um, courses of action we would put in place to make that better. What could he go back and take to his organization presented that would hopefully make that situation better? And you know how you just hear, we're talking about words. I haven't lost my train of thought at all, but I could just hear throughout on breaks, at lunch, just different things. And this gentleman who's also here from his same area in within his organization, he kept saying, oh man, I'm looking for my employee. I'm looking for my employee. And I was thrown off because when we had started the stuff to start building the stuff for the capstone, he had, he had specifically stated that the people within his organization that was on that chart were equal to him in status. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, is it, is this, is it his colleague? Or is this his boss? You know, because I'm confused now. I'm like, what's going on? So I'm a little angry, y'all, because I don't like when people lie to me. Because I'm like, if I base my whole capstone off this guy and he done lied and we get eight up in that classroom, I'm going to be one mad joker. Because that's time, that's energies, that's countless hours we've spent preparing this based off what? Your words, what you said to us. So if you lie, we're going to look like we didn't do our due diligence, you know. So I'm, 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 I'm a little irritated. Well, come to find out today, y'all, the man is his boss. We done presented the capstone and he got to take this back to his organization. And I'm like, why was it necessary for him to lie? We have to ask ourselves these questions sometimes. Why would you lie? Why would you have a need to lie? If these are things you know God would not be pleased with. God says a liar won't even tarry in his sight. Do you really know what that means? You ain't even in the, you can't even be in the same vicinity with God being a liar. You can't even be in his presence as a liar. It says it is one of the principles that God hates. If I'm not mistaken, that can be found in Proverbs 16. Think around verse 19. God hates a liar. 
We have to police that up, people. We can't lie on or about people because these are words, as we say, you're going to eat crow. Y'all know what eat crow mean, right? You know, you will say it, but it's going to come back and you're going to have to eat those same words that you put out. You know, that's what we consider sometimes karma. We put out bad karma. And then when that karma comes back. So do me this favor and I'm going to close. Please don't lie or say words like. You late to work. And this or that happened or that was almost an accident. You know what you just did? You just spoke an accident into into play. When you have something going on, don't lie and say my kid was sick. You know what you just did? You just spoke sickness over your child. See, we don't think about this when we say it because we just trying to hear him get that little quick white lie so we don't get in trouble because we was about five, ten minutes late to work. Listen, don't say that. Don't speak anything that you don't want to come to pass. If you show up, you know what I tell my boss? I overslept and I was just late or I left the house later than normal. Or, hey, traffic was worse than I thought. Should have probably left earlier, but I'm just late. Don't worry about it. I get it on the back end. Listen. Don't speak something you don't want to come to pass. Don't speak no wreck. Don't speak no sickness. Don't spit no fake whatevers. Listen, lying is not worth it. Because when that word went out, it still got a mission. Remember, I made you write that out. All the words that go out of my mouth have a mission. The mission can be good. Or the mission can be bad. Don't send those words out because they have a mission. And the Bible declares in Isaiah 55, around 8 through 10, that word, when it goes out of God's mouth, and we are like God in his image, in his likeness, when the words go out of our mouth, it is sent and it shall accomplish that which it was there sent, you know, it was sent to do. No, I don't want any of those things to come to pass. Tell people, I can't stand them. You get on my nerve. Don't speak that. You just tell people the truth. I love you. I just don't like your behavior right now. See, it's it's how you say it. It's what you're saying. You have to retailer and rethink what you're saying. Why? Because we don't want to tear the people down. We want to build them up. You know, I had to tell people, I love you. I just don't like what you're doing right now. You understand? The Bible don't tell me nowhere in the Bible I have to like something. But he says, I have to love everybody. I love you, but I don't have to like your actions. I don't have to like how you're, you know, displaying yourself right now. These are the things that we have to make, you know, known to people. You don't have to kill them with your words. You can still build them up and just still let them know what's going on without being cruel. That's why he said your tongue can be a fire that nobody can catch that joker. And I know because I had a very sharp tongue. I didn't care. I didn't care what I said, who I said it to, how you felt after I said it. None of that. Thank God for deliverance. Thank God for getting me together with my mouth because I didn't have a filter with that. I just said whatever I was feeling, but that doesn't make it justifiable and it doesn't make it right. So he said the words that come out of our mouth, we're going to be held to a standard for it. None of us are perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time. We open up our mouths. Come on, you can just go ahead and admit that to yourself. Go ahead and take this. This is the word of God. This is not coming from me. If you find someone whose speech is perfectly true, you would have a perfect person in perfect control of their life. 
I don't know a single person I've met today that have complete control of their life. They may think they do, but they don't. And if we think we're perfect, we're not. We strive. Come on, somebody say strive for perfection. That word meaning I strive for perfection. Perfection being I'm striving to be mature. I'm striving to be what God has called me to be every single day of my life. We have to check this. Next week, we're going to take it and we're going to get better. We're going to continue talking about this thing called our mouth. Because I tell you, share, 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 and share again this video. Somebody needs to hear this. Because every day we do something that's not edifying. Every day we may say or think something that's not valuable or lifting someone up. You have to first take um, captive of your thoughts. He said, even your thoughts have to be brought under the subjection of Christ. Whatever you're thinking, if it's not Christ like, you have to take control of it. You have to take captivity of it. Before, the reason he says you take captivity of it is because, God bless you, Candace. Love you, baby. But you got to take captivity of the thought because I told you, for out of the abundance of your thoughts, what? This thing called our mouth will speak it each and every time. If you leave it there long enough, it's going to come out. And so God said, first, I want you to start with your dome. If you take captive your thoughts, those things will never get a long to be in your heart long enough for you to say anything that is detrimental. So we're going to continue talking about this because I want us to live our best lives. But our best lives, believe it or not, is right there in between the under the nose and right above your chin. You can say things and speak things into your life that you never thought you'd have the ability to do. He said everything can be done if we would learn how to season up our words and speak God's word back to him. So I challenge you this week between today, between tonight and next week when we come together, make a conscious effort that everything that you say out of your mouth, season it with salt. What does that mean? Put the love of God on it. Bring God into every activity, even in your speech. And if it's not edifying somebody or it's not building them up or it's not glorifying God, I ask you, I beg of you, Find a different way to say it. Because you're going to give an account to what you say. So I love you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you for bearing with me in this hotel room and sounding like Pee Wee Herman, um, who got a frog stuck in his throat. I hope that we are by next week. These allergies will be together, but there was a huge change of weather here in Kansas. So that's the reason I'm this way. So I love you. I appreciate you. Thank God for our uh, producer, CC Shats. I love you all. And I will see you back next week at my regular time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. in European time. I love you guys. See you next time. Bye-bye.